welcome to the COVID-19 webinar responses from around the globe. This is hosted by a number of organizations and collaborations. So it's hosted by the American Anthropological Association, the Society for Medical Anthropology, the Anthropological Responses to Health Emergencies Special Interest Group, also in collaboration with the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences and their Commission on Medical Anthropology and Epidemiology, and the European Association of Social Anthropologists and their Medical Anthropology Network. So we are thrilled to be able to offer this webinar um, with a collaboration across the globe. Not thrilled for the reason what brings us all together, but we are um, grateful to be able to collaborate. During this incredibly difficult time of stress and anxiety and physical distancing protocols, we want to thank you for joining us today. We all have a role to play in this pandemic, and we are in this together, as demonstrated by the number of collaborations with this webinar. It's our hope that today is a discussion, and through this discussion, we can find ways to connect, to collaborate, and to proceed forward together. So just to begin, um, on the next slide, we've got a few housekeeping tips. So one, a disclaimer. This is a very, as everybody I think knows, this is a very fluid and ever-changing situation. Please keep that in mind, the date of the webinar, and since there'll be recording like future, keep in mind the data and information and situations could change dramatically. If you are having, if you notice in the chat window, we have people from around the world. Um, if we do, if you are having trouble with your volume or your connection, I suggest either you can log off and log back into Zoom, but you can also find a dial-in feature. Um, and so here's some connection in the meeting ID, ID there. On the Zoom menu, on the very bottom, there's a microphone icon that has a mute and unmute. If you could just keep yourself on mute, that way it allows us to hear the speakers clearly. And then there's a chat room. And so we asked what we're gonna do is have each of our speakers present and then collect all the questions and try to have our question in our Q&A discussion session at the end. So post your questions in the chat function. And my co-chair is in there. She's gonna be collecting questions. She's asking if you could put question in all caps. It makes it easier for her to collect them. So just uh, put question and then what it is in the chat room. Next slide. So my name is Kristen Hedges. Um, I am the co-chair of the Anthropological Responses to Health Emergencies. Dion Claiborne is my other co is the co-chair with me. She's in the chat room, kind of collecting all the questions, waving there to you from her from her square and icon. The next slide. Just to give you a little bit about our organization, um, we are a special interest group for the Society of Medical Anthropology. We launched as a temporary interest group during the Zika health emergency and Zika crisis. Um, and the purpose of our group is to network among members to be able to rapidly respond to developing public health issues and emergencies. So after Zika, we actually formed into a larger group that could respond to all health emergencies. We officially became our special interest group in 2017 and has since worked on Zika, Ebola, the measles outbreak, and now COVID-19. Uh, we do have a Facebook group. If you want to join it, you can just search for our name in the Facebook um, message. And then this link is to our expertise database. It is a five minute Google survey that we are trying to collect a database of experts from a number of issues. That way when something comes up, we can easily turn to that database and quickly respond and collaborate together. So next slide. So as I said, my name is Kristen Hedges. We're gonna give introductions. We're gonna give a, a verbal description for those uh, who could be visually impaired in joining us today. So I'm Kristen Hedges. I am a white female with medium length brown hair. I'm currently sitting in my bedroom in my newly created home office. I'm hoping that my children do not run into the room and interrupt us. And I'm gonna have each of our presenters uh, introduce themselves. So. We just want to go through the outline. Davide, could you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Davide Barbieri from Italy. I'm a white male. I'm uh, sitting in at my desk at home, of course, like everybody else in Italy now, I think. And Sasha, are you uh, on here still? Um, I'm here. Hello. Hi. Hi to everybody. I'm here waiting for my turn. <laughs> okay. Do you want to give just a quick description so people can connect um, your voice of who uh, you are? Description of, of my lecture? No, uh, just of who, of who you are. Just an introduction quickly. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm um, the director of the Institute for Anthropological Research in Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, institute is, uh, has uh, about 40 people 
and we are do, doing uh, four fields anthropology uh, in scientific institutes. We are also doing a lot uh, biomedical research, uh, genetics. We have now a totally new laboratory in the terms of uh, genetics, uh, chemical analytics, and uh, some some more stuff. Great, thank you. And Gideon, are you on? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone from the town of Los Baños in the Philippines, where I am in my parents' house. I have set up this mini veranda where I work, and it's 1 a.m. here, but I'm wide awake and really excited to be part of this conversation. Great. Thank you. So if you see the slide here, this shows an outline of our presenters. Each presenter is going to speak for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to the question and answer session. So we will just go ahead and turn it over back to Davida now. Next yes, hello. Uh, thanks. You can move on with the slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about something very unfortunate, uh, about the spread of the COVID-19, the coronavirus in Italy, especially in the North Italy from where I'm speaking currently. Next slide. If we take a wider look for just a second, and we can see there is a, a big difference between low-income countries and high-income countries when it comes to the causes of death. And, and this data, um, uh, I took this data from the World Health Organization website. So um, on the left side, we can see that there are many, many red red bars, and uh, we, which mean they are uh, communicable diseases. And the top cause of death is in fact lower respiratory infections. But if we look, um, to the chart on the right side, in high income countries, uh, mostly people die of heart disease, stroke, and, and cancer. Actually, if you, if you sum up all the cancers here, um, probably you have the second longest um, bar. There's one notable exception that is lower respiratory infections, again, which sounds a lot like pneumonia. Next slide. So these are um, recent data. I actually update them uh, today in the morning. Um, currently, we have more than 80,000 positive individuals. More than 4,000 of them are in a intensive care unit. More than 13,000 have died so far. Uh, we have a, a very, a very uh, bad stat, very bad score on um, for what concerns the case fatality rate, which appears to be like 12% much higher than in any other country for some reason. In China, it was supposed to be between two and three. Uh, the case fatality rate is the number of people who die uh, because they are infected. Next slide. As you can see, the most affected region is the region of Lombardy around Milan, um, the dark blue one. I live just south of it in the second most affected region, which is Emilia. Uh, it's a neighboring region, of course. And we can make a comparison uh, with China because, uh, and the region of Hubei, actually, the province of Hubei. Um, we have more or less the same amount of, of inhabitants of um, 60 million. Actually, I think Hubei is 58 million, while Italy is 60, but more or less the same. And um, we do have a rather high density of population, around 200 people per square kilometers, but in, in Hubei is 300 and actually in Wuhan is 700. And, and, and density of population is certainly affecting in pandemics. Uh, please, uh, next slide. The main issues that I tried to, to 
tackle in, 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 in the recent weeks, were the prevalence and the case fatality rate. And, and to be honest, what, what I have realized so far is that we do not know much. Um, people, like always in, in, in such periods like the one we're living, uh, are looking for certainties. But the only certain things is that we, don't, we do not know much. Um, for example, when it comes to prevalence, the, the amount of population uh, the numeratory is virtually unknown, let's say, because it, it depends a lot, of course, on, on the amount of tests that you perform. And, and of course, we have limited resources. It, it would be, I think, impossible to, to test 60 million of people in, in, in a short time. The other issue is the, is the case fatality rate. And here we have even more uncertainties because we do not know the, the denominator, the number of positives, but there's also less, a, lot, uh, a lot of uncertainty about the numerator, the number of deceased people. Uh, because some suggest that the positives are, um, uh, sorry, the deaths are overestimated, for example. Some say that, uh, and, and that's quite typical, we, we decided to, to include um, maybe very old people with, with uh, uh, comorbidities, maybe cancer. And if they had the coronavirus, we actually counted them in. But there are also people who think instead that we are underestimating them. So, the bottom line is that we don't know much about uh, neither the prevalence nor the case fatality rate. Uh, next slide, please. These are the, the trends and, and, and they still look very bad. Um, I think this is last night trend. So the, uh, the disease that is the, um, it, um, the, the orange line and uh, it's still going up quickly, as you can see. Luckily, the uh, line of uh, the blue line of those in, in intensive care is uh, plateauing a bit. Um, but, but yes, the death toll is very, um, very high. Uh, next, thank you. Um, I tried to make a comparison between the small town of Vo Eugania, which is close to Venice. Actually, uh, the region around Venice is the third most affected region, just um, east of Lombardy. In this small town, about 3,000 inhabitants, they tested almost everyone. So we thought that this could represent a good sample to measure prevalence. Um, they had a rather low prevalence. Um, just 2.5% of the people who got tested were positives. And actually, most of them showed no symptoms. Most of them were men, by the way, I mean the positive. And, and this seems to be consistent with what they found in, um, in China, because most of the people actually had very mild symptoms, okay, the 80%. And those who died were actually um, admitted to hospital in critical conditions, and, and then they went into a, an intensive care unit. And, and half of them eventually died. Uh, please, next slide. I also tried to compare the age distribution. And here we can see there's, there's an interesting fact. It seems that in Italy, the prevalence uh, grows with age. Uh, maybe here it goes down, but, but consider that um, the um, life expectancy in Italy is around 83. So you don't have many people above 83. So let's say that uh, prevalence is high among the elderly. Um, it is not exactly the same here in China, because you can see that uh, the blue are the positives. This shape is much more symmetric and prevalence 
tends to go down where fatality goes high. That's why overall mortality can be lower because they have less uh, positives where case fatality rate is naturally higher. Um, please, next slide. Something similar happens, or at least seems to happen in Germany. Most of the infected people are adults between the age of 35 and 59. They have a rather low prevalence uh, among the elderly, those who are above 60. I took this data from the Robert Koch Institute, okay, so the leading authority in Germany. And, and, and actually in Germany, they have a low case fatality rate. Uh, please, next slide. But this is another very interesting case, the small town of Nembro. Nembro is northwest of Bergamo. Bergamo is the most affected city in Italy now. It's northwest of Milan, so it's in the region of Lombardy. This is something I wanted you as well, but I couldn't find the data. Anyway, um, they checked the average number of deaths in previous years between 2015 and 2019. And that's the, the blue line. Okay, you can see it here. And then they check um, those who were declared to uh, uh, be uh, dead because of coronavirus. And that's, that, that's the green line here. Then they counted those who died for any reason this year. And that's actually the red line. It seems that the number of reported deaths is um, heavily underestimated. Maybe four times. Probably because many people die at home and diagnosed, they don't get a, a test, you know, when, when they get ill, for example. Uh, many of these people are um, old people in uh, nursing homes and they may die quickly without uh, a diagnosis and without being taken to hospital. So you, you can hear the, the ambulance very often now, yeah. Uh, please, uh, next slide. And, and that's the, the, the picture on the left is one of the most impressive thing I've ever seen in my whole life. And, and, and consider that I, I'm an Iraq veteran, but I, I saw this long queue of military trucks carrying coffins. They took them to uh, crematoria south of Milan because the crematorium um, in Bergamo was working full time and couldn't handle the to low. So they had to carry the corpses in, in other to other towns and in, in the area. And actually something similar happened in Wuhan as well. There appear to be tens of thousands of of urns with ashes. Uh, many more than 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 the beds which were declared by the official authority. So it seems that it is not so simple to, to actually count the people who died because of this coronavirus. Of course, there was speculation about the fact that maybe the, um, and, and that's been suggested by the, by the Time magazine, but also by some independent um, uh, media agency in China that the government was not being transparent. But whatever the main reason, it is not so simple to, to do the math. It's not so simple to, of course, the truth will come with time probably. But right now, we do not know the exact number of the deceased. Please, next slide. Uh, this is actually my study um, I submitted yesterday. Since the 
number of, of positive cases is not, uh, is not accurate, is not reliable number, and not even that of the deceased. I decided to take a look at uh, patients in, in ICUs, in intensive care units, which is something more easily observable. And on the left side, you can see the trend since the very beginning. The only optimistic thing I can show you today is the chart on the right side. That's the daily increment of patients in, in intensive care. And as you can see, it's slowing down, which means it, it is still positive. So the number of patients who require intensive care is still growing, but more slowly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a chart I found on the on the Financial Times, actually, and and it, it shows that, for example, if you take a look at Lombardy and um, the dark line, it seems that Spain and and even New York are going up. Uh, faster. So, and, and actually the, because um, here you, you can see the, uh, uh, on the horizontal line you can see the number of days since the beginning of the outbreak, let's say, and, and here uh, the, the vertical axis will show you the number of deaths. And, and you can see that New York is going very fast as, as Catalonia and Madrid. So, um, in a few days, the situation there can, could be even worse than than um, than in, in in Milan. Next slide. One thing which I suggested is to start monitoring patients from the moat. There's a few good reasons to do that. First of all, we don't want healthcare uh, staff, professionals, to get infected, because otherwise there would be nobody to cure us. Another good reason is to have the biomedical data collected in real time, because being late can be fatal. I was talking to a couple, uh, um, a couple of friends, two very good friends, working in, they're both medical doctors, anesthesiolo anesthesiologists, and, and they both work in intensive care units here at the local hospital. They say it could be a matter of hours. If you are too late and oxygen saturation goes down, the patient has to be taken to an intensive care unit and, and he's at very high risk. But if we can monitor them from, from home, if they can stay at home, and in case they, um, their oxygen saturation goes down, they can get the proper medication without them being taken to hospital, which will diminish the burden of our health, national health system. Because now it's being overwhelmed, especially intensive care units. Um, it is not so difficult. All you need is, a, is a, essentially a, a pulse oximeter, the object you see on the, on the left, which will measure oxygen saturation, and a cell phone. So, in, in my opinion, this will help um, enforcing the, the policy of social distancing. And, and also we have uh, medical professionals to be on time. Okay, uh, please, next slide. Okay, so I've come to conclusions. Um, uh, my final points are that prevalence and, and case fatality rate are actually no. There's something very weird, very strange. In Italy, it appears to be much higher than in any other place. Um, for example, in Germany and South Korea is estimated at around 1%. One, one deceased every 100 positives. Um, 
Another thing which should be highlighted is that social distancing works, but um, contagion may continue at home. So staying at home is not necessarily a, a, a synonym of social distancing. Uh, there may be, for example, you know, five people living in the same apartment, like a family with three children. And if one gets ill, and, and maybe a children might be even asymptomatic, then everybody will get ill. We have to take care of intensive care units. That's the critical part of the, of the national health system. So we must predict accurately how many we need. And to diminish the burden on hospitals, we need to take care of patients at home. Um, and, and I will give you my final consideration. Besides staying at home, we, we need to separate the weak, those who have a weak immune system or those who have some chronic condition, but those who are old, over 60 or 70, we must separate them from the rest, from the young and the healthy. And now there's a proposal, uh, especially in, in Veneto, in the, in the region of Venice. They want to check uh, the immune response of, of citizens blood analysis. And eventually, those with a good immune response may go back to work. Because otherwise, after facing um, the pandemic, we may have to face another problem, that of poverty. So, uh, this is more or less my bottom line. I, 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 I know I, I couldn't give you certainties or anything more accurate than, than this, but this is what I know uh, so far today. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Davida. Next up, we have Sasha. I'm here. Hi. Right. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much. So now, uh, thank you, Davide, for your lecture. It was uh, really, really interesting, especially the last uh, thing that uh, people with the good, good immune systems must go to work and the same thing will probably must happen in Croatia very soon because otherwise the economy of Croatia will be down on the knees. It's uh, anyway, at the moment, down on the knees and, and it's very difficult and probably later on we'll have a more uh, hungry children than, than uh, people who died from from corona and you know now it's 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 on us to, to see the best the best way to protect the older and to protect also the future of nation and future of humans so i'll start just uh, uh with my presentation as uh, i um, introduce myself i'm director of the institute for anthropological research mainly we are uh, working uh, on the complex diseases, uh, diabetes, type 2, uh, cardiovascular diseases uh, linked with some uh, internal and external factors, means genetics. And we also collaborate a lot with the uh, United States, with um, a medical uh, university, Cincinnati. We already had the two NIH projects on this. Now we are also in this uh, crisis uh, trying to help also the Creation Hospital for Infectious Diseases in, you know, this testing, testing the uh, COVID. So uh, our people and our, uh, um, uh, you know, devices are, you know, also on this disposition to the hospital and medical services at the moment. Can we go on with the slides? So, okay. So Croatia is a small country, very close to Italy. As you can see, uh, a bit less uh, than uh, 4 million of inhabitants. And probably this is why we, we still don't have a lot of dead people from Corona. We have, uh, uh, at the moment, a thousand people infected. It's official numbers. Probably there's uh, 10 times more, but we don't know that. And uh, seven, seven dead people until uh, uh, recent. Uh, the life expectancy uh, birth is 78, um, capital is Zagreb, unfortunately, uh, nine days ago we had a uh, pretty strong earthquake and uh, the city is pretty damaged. 
and so everything comes on a big 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 scene so uh the people move out from the houses and some of the people now uh, actually are living uh, somewhere else and that was also a question will it you know uh have an impact on on uh, uh, covid uh, dist the distribution can, can we go on with a slide thank you uh so i'll just uh, come through uh, COVID-19, all we know by now. So there are six type of coronavirus already known beside uh, COVID. Uh, SARS and uh, MERS were more lethal, as we know, but were not so infected. So uh, it was a better situation uh, than COVID. It's very infective and this is the problem and this is why uh, the the people the, the number of infected people rise very very extensively uh, exponential spreading one person will infect at least two in six day number of infected people will be doubled so and that's the problem for the uh, health care system the main problem with the covid is the health care system um, as already uh, david that uh, told you the problem the risk are people older and immunosuppressive people uh, younger people uh, children are not so, so in problems so probably separation uh, older and the immunosuppressive from younger people will be uh, something what is needed you know in this situation so that rate uh, all around the world is uh, two comma three percent but you know it's a new disease and we can now uh, a very difficult to say uh, what is uh, exact uh, 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 a number of uh, death rate. Uh, persons over 70 years of age, death rate is uh, around 8% and over 80 year uh, age up to 15%. It's really, really high. Problem uh, for the patients with chronic diseases, uh, cancer, people with cancer, 6% high blood pressure, 6 diabetes, 7,3, and heart diseases, 10,5. Uh, all these numbers, you know, are now from some of the uh, journals, uh, but of course, we'll still need a time to measure all these numbers because they are still, you know, in, in, you know, in the move. 80% of patients, but this is uh, something what if there is something good, that's, that's good. 80% of patients have only small symptoms or even don't have symptoms at all. It means that uh, the patients with a good immune system and uh, younger, younger patients. Can we move on? Right. So a little bit about symptoms. Uh, symptoms, 83%, they have fever. 82% cold and 31% muscular pain, and that's it. Uh, the biggest problem is that 20% of patients with heavy clinical symptoms, and they are really a problem for the healthcare system in the first place. So from this 20% uh, 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 from, from Lancet, from the journal, 76% uh, patients need oxygen, therapy 13% needs non-invasive ventilation and 4% need in invasive ventilation but statistic is not telling us a real picture why because you know we now have all these numbers and uh, we actually don't know the real number of uh, infected people because we know only those people who came to hospital and who are tested and as I told you on my first slide, probably in Croatia now there's 10,000 people who are infected and we don't know because they don't have symptoms or they have just uh, small symptoms and they are not going to the hospital and they are not tested. And we don't know this. And that's also the problem for those who, who, who can have a really heavy clinical symptoms. Can we move on? So I would like to, um, in Croatia, a lot of people trying to compare this with the flu. So uh, it is and it's not comparable to the flu because it's totally different disease. And uh, we can only compare it in statistical way. So these are statistics um, 
on a flu. So you can see a death rate on, on this uh, uh, here. So in US, 2018-2019. Uh, so um, the estimation of uh, dead people in the world, according to uh, WHO, is about uh, 290 to 650,000 people per year. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that we cannot, we can only estimate, estimate, and all those people are more. Most of those people are people with the uh, three, four, or more chronic diseases and are older. But the flu is not so infectious. The flu is not uh, growing so exponentially and uh, is going through the all over the season so we have time and the whole, uh, healthcare system have enough time and uh, enough uh, uh, medical staffs to serve this problem also the patients from the flu are vaccinated that's very important to know uh, so all the people usually take the vaccination and that helps a lot can we go on So, Corona is a new virus, much as I told you, much more uh, uh, infective. And um, the main problem, what I already mentioned, is a breakdown of hospital capacity. So now what we are trying to do in Croatia is to uh, enlarge this uh, period, not to let COVID to go exponentially up, because in this case, uh, we are, you know, uh, we, we can face with the Italian, Italian case uh, and uh, in this case a lot of people can die which are not actually, which will not die in the case the hospital system is ready to, you know, uh, and prepared to uh, give them an um, oxygen because, you know, the respirators Probably there are not uh, enough respirators. Croatia, we have around uh, probably 1,000, 2,000 respirators. Can you imagine, you know, 4 million of people? So if you have like, uh, I don't know, half a million of older, 5%, 10%, you know, the, the, hospital will, will, the hospitals will break down. You can... Yeah. So that's the hospital. This hospital is a clinical hospital Dubrava and we prepared the whole hospital exclusively for uh, COVID-19 with the military help. As you can see uh, down there uh, are, you know, like uh, uh, military um, uh, prepared for the easier, easy, easier patients and, and uh, up in the hospital you know, like thousands to two thousand people can be like with the more heavily, heavily uh, cases. It's uh, in Croatia at the moment, run with the time. Um, some uh, people are expecting that the disease will fall down also a little bit with the summer, with the uh, hot weather. Uh, but we'll see at the moment. We are uh, hoping that everything will be fine in one month, month and a half, and that people can go to the work because the economy will, is suffering at the moment. So a little bit more of uh, statistics, um, infections by the countries. So big differences between the countries, uh, you know, many reasons, you know, it's also about the population, the, the lifestyle of the population, it's not the same. Uh, we were talking about Italy, and uh, I read some somewhere about the Sweden and the Swedish system, uh, healthcare system is brilliant, and uh, they are doing probably now. They don't have uh, more um, death cases than than they have really low death cases uh, in comparison to Norway and to Denmark. Uh, but it's a quality of decision. It's um, now we need uh, quality and probably a very fast decision. Um, on time reaction means uh, closing the borders, you know, separation and putting the people in quarantine. But the separation all for, from young is the, the most important thing. The most important thing is separation and then quarantine. 
uh, in this disease shows in Italy, shows in China that this is the most important thing. Uh, prepared healthcare system, lifestyle and discipline. And I will tell a little bit more in Croatia, the people are not disciplined and now they start to be because they realize they are looking in, at the Italy and now they're really, really afraid not to be in uh, the same situation. Also, uh, it's about the age groups, um, many countries and uh, many uh, nations. Um, Italy has a really uh, old population. Croatia has also a lot of uh, old, old people. And uh, uh, if they are living with the young people, and in Italy probably this is the way of living, that a lot of uh, old people are living with the young people in comparison with the Sweden, uh, where the on the uh, north of Europe, when the people, all the people are not living so much with the, with the young people in the same flat or house. So this could be also one of the reasons why uh, in Italy or in Spain uh, as well, uh, the situation can escalate uh, to big, big, big numbers. This can be... Uh, so uh, what was happening in Croatia during the pandemia? At the start of, uh, of course, uh, 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 it starts to be panic. The people run to the supermarkets, uh, buying everything, you know. Um, and I was talking with some people and I was telling them it's not war. Uh, so the food, um, the, the, the food supplies must be enough, you know, for the, all this situation. Uh, but the panic, at once the panic starts. And for this, uh, probably um, the media are the most important in these things because in Croatia, some media, especially internet portals, are writing sensational. They need a sensation. And this can lead to the panic. If, for example, um, we have um, cases when the uh, internet portals are writing so the, the guy with 21 years old died from cor corona from covid okay uh, what is his health status you know this is very important not to make a panic inside the population you know uh, the virus is very serious but we don't need a panic uh, also uh, so uh, buying uh, uh, food supplies in panic can lead to real sort shortage of food. And that's also not good. Not now, not in the war. You know, Croatia had a war 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and we are avoid on some um, very, very uh, hard situations. But still, you know, now the people don't see their enemy and uh, they are a bit afraid at the moment. So in a short time, probably um, it the, the lifestyle is changing a lot. Uh, in Croatia, we don't have a quarantine at all, so we can go out. Um, we are still using that. It's um, not a recommendation to go out, but uh, you know, uh, physical activity is also very, very important for your uh, immune system especially for the young people because you know um, a lot of things can happen after the coronavirus you know if you are staying at home eating a lot then obesity uh, from obesity cardiovascular diseases uh, so many things are happening you know uh, according to this disease so the corona is not the only problem the problem will come after corona as well uh, sitting at home for a long time you know can lead to uh, some obese people obesity as well and uh, it's also not a, a good thing so we have to to handle and to see what can we do to reduce all these things next slide please yeah and now uh what is happening in croatia at the moment you know uh it's it's about it's about uh, a lot of people are asking about the masks should we wear the mask or should we not wear the mask so uh it's very different um opinion but uh, as you can see there is a lot of different type of masks so, so some of these masks like this one thought is very good but all these others are you know um not not good at all because they are you know they have a 
to be calls and, and you know, the virus can, can go through and it's, uh, you can wear it or not wearing, it's the same for you. But what is very important is hygiene. Hygiene is very important. To wash your hands. Uh, testing during pandemia is also very important, but especially for the medical staff. Especially for the medical staff, because if you have a lot of infected people, then um, it's very difficult because all these testings are, um, the ratio of these tests is long and it's very expensive also. And if you, but testing the medical staff is the probably most important at the moment. So the medic, medical staff must be clean from the corona. Um, and of course, discipline. To be disciplined, it's, it's also very, very important at the moment. Uh, in Croatia, we we'll still have some problems, but the people should take care on themselves in the first place. Um, this are uh, testing. Uh, a little bit more about testing. The uh, debate: Should we test all the people, or should we not test all the people? So the Korean did test all the population and probably this is also good if, you, if the population is very disciplined. Uh, in Croatia, as I told you, it's not only, uh, it's not so easy tests, it's very expensive tests, but also uh, the tests which uh, need uh, PCR techniques, so we need uh, more time to test uh, the people. Um, from my perspective, and as I can see at the moment, as I already told you, testing of medical staff will be uh, just enough at the moment if the older and uh, people in the risk are, you know, separated and in quarantine. So in Croatia, we are testing only people who actually feel. Uh, just uh, to let you a little bit know, um, yeah, just trying to tell you about in Croatia, we are testing only people who fulfill both clinical and epidemiological criteria at the moment. And putting the people in quarantine for 14 days, those who came from abroad, especially from Italy or from Austria, Germany, all around the world actually now is the law to go 14 days in quarantine. Now I will go a little bit uh, more in the history and uh, to show one beautiful place in Croatia, it's called Dubrovnik. Uh, very uh, touristic, very old city, medieval city, which was very, very fam famous as uh, uh, with a very good economy at that time. So uh, very educated people at that time. So they already in the, in the history in 1377 uh, just made a quarantine, first quarantine this part of Europe. Um, because of many, many um, uh, infectious diseases at that time. Um, and actually, uh, this was functioning uh, afterwards. They made a quarantine just in front of the city. You can probably see from this photo, but in the next slide, I'll show you. Uh, you can see that was a punishment also that at that time. And so they solve all the problem with quarantine. At that time, probably um, some of the uh, scientists are still today uh, telling that the quarantine is the, the best way of uh, uh, helping people not to be infected at the moment. So we can go further. So this is the quarantine uh, in front of the Bromley today. It's a place for touristic, uh, uh, touristic things, the touristic uh, the concerts and uh, things like that. But it was the, uh, the, the place where the uh, Dubrovnik uh, government at that time put the people and the animals as well. And they had to, to be there uh, 30 days before they enter the city. So this was a little bit uh, historical uh, view. Now a little bit more about the Croatia. Uh, it's close to Italy, I already told you. So uh, the people are usually moving very, very uh, 
very, very often to Italy, especially to this northern part of Italy. So it means to Milano, to all this region, to skiing, you know, to these places for, for skiing. So a lot of people, uh, um, even one month before, were in Italy, you know, on a football game, and then, of course, uh, skiing and everything, and they came back. And so uh, the first cases were actually in Croatia was uh, uh, from Italian uh, case. They came from the, this uh, legendary, unfortunately legendary football game uh, between Atlanta and uh, Valencia. And so a few of Croatians came to Croatia and all of them were infected from COVID. Happily, those people were young and uh, they didn't have any, any heavy, heavy disease. So now in the Croatia, I just, if, 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 if we can go uh, back, slide back. Uh, there are two, two, two sorts of people, those who are in a big panic and those who actually are, you know, not, not caring at all on disease. So both of this is not good. So some, somewhere in the middle will be the best at the moment. Now uh, all the uh, shops, food stores uh, are closed. Everything is closed except food stores and pharmacies since 15th of March. And it will be uh, at the moment until 15th of April, probably much longer. But uh, at the moment it stays like 15th of April. Um, and all these food stores and pharmacies are really uh, open until five o'clock in the afternoon. So it's very strange for us. Um, very low people on the street. It's really, you know, like um, very, very uh, hectic situation, you know, in, in Croatia at the moment. So uh, I'm not avoiding such such situation without people. Nothing is happening. Uh, everything is, you know, like staying. Nobody, everybody are working from home and uh, you cannot have a meeting you cannot uh, talk in, in you know face to face to people so it's, it's a really strange situation at the moment in Croatia. now we can thank you so a few questions what happens in croatia uh, now as we can see we are doing well and we are doing good seven that one thousand people uh, infected so the, our uh, Minister of Health are doing a probably good job uh, with, all, uh, uh, with, with the whole government. And um, my question, was it too late? Was it uh, too late to make some decision? It's always a political question. You're always balancing between economy and disease, uh, between old people and the future. You know, it's always a lot, a lot of very sensitive question in such occasions. Uh, should uh, borders, probably borders should be closed more before, you know, that's all, that was also the question because still in Croatia, but on the other way, Croatia is a touristic country, 20% of BDP is from tourism and it's very heavy to live without tourism. Separation order for, from and immunosuppressive people was not made at all and probably this is a, a biggest mistake as I can see now at the moment and uh, my suggestions will be strong separation and probably this will uh, give us more results. This will give us the opportunity that those people that David also said who are good with immune system can work and can, you know, like, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, build the economy of Croatia because otherwise, you know, we will be uh, really, really in a bad, bad uh, situation after, after Corona. So the, this is the question, is quitting the whole economy and sending people to work at home a good model? That's a question. So Sweden has another model and uh, until now it, it shows that Sweden has a really uh, good model, you know, but we'll see in what, what the future will bring to them. And should we all go to quarantine and uh, what is the model for future? Probably one of the model is to quit the quarantine for all, just put those who are, you know, as I told you, uh, in the risk and put some model of, you know, um, models uh, for special models for such a change. Of behavior, of course. 
So uh, this is uh, stringency level in Croatia, uh, according to the University of Oxford research, Croatia has uh, the most rigid measures in comparison to number of cases. So, but this is until now uh, doing, uh, giving a good results. We'll see what will give us to economy afterwards. That's another question. So models of prevention, as I told you, this will be probably, um, we have to work really seriously now to see a real model of prevention. In such cases and probably in, in probably future cases, which will happen as well. So we have to see if uh, all, there will always be a risk, risk groups. And uh, those who are in risk, should be separated and all other should be a really a specific way of behavior and probably everything can work on a really uh, special uh, uh, sp special models of behavior and then probably we can uh, 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 let the economy just flu you know just go go on and uh, because you know anyway you know if if it takes more time we will have to put the people to work, go back to work. So uh, what happens in Croatia as well during the quarantine, as you can see, um, it was a pretty high earthquake in the city of Zagreb. This is the capital of Zagreb. Uh, the damage is really uh, high also at my institute. So we are now trying to repair the damage, but what happened this morning as you can see, a lot, of a lot of people must go on the street. So the whole quarantine and all these stay at home, just go to the water and the people just went out, you know, uh, you know, in, uh, and um, another problem is uh, damage of the hospitals. As you can see, this is one of the hospitals and it's a uh, lung hospital in Zagreb. And this, this is a uh, heavy damage. So uh, we didn't have a luck in this moment. COVID in the future, of course, um, I already talked with some of my friends in France, in uh, Western Europe, and uh, they are working on a vaccination, on vaccine. And of course they will uh, find some vaccine very, very soon. They are hoping so. Uh, but of course, then you need uh, more time for testing and uh, more and more time for producing. So, in, you know, we are expecting a vaccination for a large number of people in one year, one and a half year, not before that. Uh, disease will probably be seasonal and will probably come back in autumn. This is another problem. And because of this, we have to think about it because we cannot uh, put the people not to work, you know, uh, for six months uh, next, from next autumn to next spring. Uh, and of course, uh, as you can see on this on this photo and this picture, actually uh, is showing probably the best what will happen after the COVID. Uh, Bankrupt uh, of for many companies, uh, unemployment in Croatia it's, it's it's raising from day to day, so it will bring the poetry. Uh, poetry bring the crime. A poetry bring depression and some complex diseases which can also uh, all these things can lead also to suicides so the worry is for the next five six or ten years after corona is a uh, big big worry about that and uh, at the end you know uh, there is no, not, not much uh, left, I can say, you know, closing the border, separation and uh, quarantine for risk groups uh, and uh, always have a prepared uh, health system. And we scientists, we have to work on that very, very heavily now. So where is Croatia going now? Croatia is a touristic country, as I told you, 20% of BDP is from tourism, 
We don't have any tourists in the moment. Probably the whole season is uh, uh, lost. So for Croatian economy, it's a really, really bad issue. I know that it's for the whole of the world, but uh, Croatia don't have a lot of industry. Um, uh, Croatia is not so a rich country that have uh, some, 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 some uh, uh, money beside, and you know uh, we still don't know what uh, what is what we have to face with. And at the, in the end, uh, you know, we have to quit one conference this year, but we are organizing another one and uh, um, hoping that everything will be solved until then and that, we, that the conference will be, uh, 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 you know, um, held. Uh, I'm all inviting you all to come to, to the EYS conference in Shibenik. Um, we are also thinking to 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 make one symposium on COVID, also to see the anthropological view and uh, from more more not only from epidemiological view than from all uh, interdisciplinary view and because it's very important as you can see the COVID the disease is not only a problem of health system is a problem much much wider than a, than the health system at all. Okay, that's something else we can go, uh, we can move on. So thank you and uh, I'm here for, for any uh, further question. Thank you. I'm finished at the moment, yeah. Hello, so I guess I'll go right away or should I wait for... Yes. Go ahead, no, Gideon. No, no, go ahead. Go Sorry, right. my connection shorted out. Go ahead, Gideon. No worries. No worries. So uh, good day to everyone. Good evening to everyone. I'm here in the Philippines to share with you how the pandemic is unfolding. Next slide. Now, what I want to emphasize in this brief presentation is how is what, the fact that the pandemic actually is going through different phases. So it's not just one event, but it's evolving. So that's what I want to emphasize in, in this presentation. Next slide. This is some very brief background that is relevant for, for the pandemic. The first is the Philippines is a very large population with 10% Filipinas overseas, so in, in most incidents, including the cruise ship in, in Japan, where there were so many cases, that many Filipinos were there in the ship, and also in the Middle East, in Hong Kong, in many places, there's a Filipino population, so it's really a pandemic of great concern for the country beyond the, our shores. Now, at the same time, another point is that there's a very huge informal sector. So later on, I'll be talking about how the, the pandemic might affect also the, the poor in a very different way. Next slide. Another context to the pandemic is the fact that our president now, who's notorious for his drug war, is also locally controversial because of his subservience to China. Over the past, Few years we've seen Chinese tourists coming in in droves, Chinese investment coming in the Philippines with some resentment about the outsized role, and of course, Chinese militarization of the South China Sea. So that's the back, a backdrop to the pandemic. Next slide. So as you can see, it's it's easy to speak of the pandemic as something that's just happened when the graph rose but even from the January to February there were some important incidents that I want to talk about shortly next slide 
So right now, we're at, by now it's already 2,000 cases with over 100 deaths. So still relatively low, but just like in the case of Italy and Croatia, there, there's fear of underestimation because we're not doing enough testing that in itself is controversial. So later on, I will discuss it as well. Next slide. So for this presentation, I want to foreground the role of objects in my talk, uh, face masks, hand sanitizers, and how they quickly emerged as part of the meaning making and also the visualization of an invisible virus. I also want to highlight the political dynamics of the pandemic, which I'm sure is also very resonant in all countries, how politicians either downplay the crisis or spectacularize it. And in doing so, I'll be sharing my own experiences. In fact, today, I fell in line in a supermarket for seven hours. Uh, I was just there waiting, but I was also observing, of course, but this is a, a very real phenomenon for me. And we're now in, under community quarantine. This is the third week now where only people who need to buy food medicines are allowed to leave. And they're giving passes for each village where only one person per family can, can leave. So it's a very, very strange new world we're in. Next slide. So I would characterize the first phase as the time when the first case was confirmed and there was initial fear about the virus. And then there's a second phase where people became more complacent. And the third phase is when the cases kept rising and this quarantine was implemented here. Next slide. So in the initial fear and panic phase, it started in January 23, when the first suspected case was announced. People started wearing masks, and that would lead up to the January 30 and February 2. The first case outside China was reported in the Philippines. So as you can imagine, that was also a source of grave concern. Next slide people began to wear masks. Uh, it's almost spontaneous that on that day that it was announced that there was a suspected case, you could see one third of the people wearing masks in the malls, drugstores ran out of masks. And the pop politics at the time also interestingly revolved around face masks. Next slide. Because at the time, the pandemic or the, it wasn't a pandemic yet but it was concentrated in Wuhan and at the time they were needful of masks and the Philippines apparently exported three million uh, masks to China and that was a source of controversy among the politicians why, why did you do that uh, we also need masks here next slide and the pandemic at the time also had a lot of discrimination, particularly at the people, well, in the Philippines, it's mostly people who, are of China, who came from China or Chinese Filipinos. There's a very significant proportion of Chinese Filipinos here. So the discourse also revolved around China, that it's your fault, the third because you're so close to China, you should have stopped the flights ahead. And until now, there's some discourse, but particularly at the beginning, there's a lot of concentration on, on China. Next slide. Eventually, however, there was relative calm and complacency. People even declared victory. Some public health officials even said that, look, we managed to contain the virus. Next slide. And uh, reflection, academics started thinking about the pandemic, but not yet in these exceptional terms that we're dealing with now. They even planned this um, talk about how discrimination is unfolding, but then it was eventually cancelled as the pandemic got ahead of everyone. Next slide. 
even so, however, in this latent phase, I, I would call it a, like a latent intermediate phase, some of these hygienic practices that started during the first phase be began to be institutionalized, including malls declaring themselves to be sanitized zones and airlines asking people where, where you came from through checklists. So that became somehow institutionalized. Next slide. And finally, we come to the lock, what people commonly call lockdown or quarantine, it followed the rise of cases, WHO declaring pandemic, and the government declaring that the whole capital region will, will be locked down, causing massive movement, classes were suspended, work was suspended. And the public health people at the time were arguing that because we're a third world country and we don't have the means to test everyone or come up with high-tech solutions, we have to resort to this draconian measure of a real quarantine because that's the only way to stop it, even though it's leading to a lot of problems as well. Next slide. So as you can see in some of these pictures, it was a military militaristically approached quarantine. There were checkpoints. There are now reports of abuses being done for people who are, who are trying to work, people who are trying to cross these checkpoints. They're spraying disinfectants in vehicles, people who are going through these checkpoints. So it's a really strange situation we, we were, we're now in. And those thermal scanners, I'm not sure if how common those are in your countries, but here it's very common. And people are even questioning if they have value because some of them don't even register a temperature more than 35 degrees or 36 degrees. So obviously they cannot be working, but these are objects somehow play an important role in for people to visualize and to actualize the, what's happening. Next slide. So that's another uh, example. Next slide. And instead of the stigma being focused on the people who are associated with China, now a days people who are rumored or confirmed to be to test positive for coronavirus are being stigmatized. They're, they're being driven away from their houses. They're being forbidden entry to their villages. And that's happening with healthcare workers as well. It's just very recent. This past week, we're hearing reports of doctors, nurses being shunned by, by people and even being attacked. There were two cases. One was thrown bleach in a public market. So it's a very troubling development. Also very rapidly evolving how stigma shifted and discrimination with the healthcare workers now bearing the brunt of it. And of course, as we've seen in other medical conditions, it will make dealing with a pandemic even harder because people will now hide their status, they hide their identity as COVID positive given this discrimination that's happening. Next slide. So this, this is one of the examples I was talking about. Someone was thrown bleach, a hospital worker. Next slide. And then we're also seeing, however, so on one hand, there's discrimination, but at the same time, healthcare workers are being hailed as heroes as well, and rightfully so, because around 20%, if I'm not mistaken, of the people who have died so far are healthcare workers. So there's also a lot of move towards supporting them because they're running out of equipment, masks, personal protective equipment. So there's also private initiatives that are being mounted to, to support them. Next slide. So today, what's happening is that people are demanding testing. So somehow, if masks were the object 
at the be beginning and hand sanitizers, you need to wash your hands. But now we see that this is the testing kits that's be politically and, and publicly debated as something that, that, that we need. And it, just a few hours ago, the government announced that they will do mass testing for healthcare workers. So until now, this is an evolving situation. Text. And I, I also want to let, go back a bit and say that there's rise of false claims. Uh, some people are claiming, for example, that egg, boiled egg can cure coronavirus, banana, or many other cures. So including uh, alternative treatments. So, it, and many it's spreading on Facebook, it's getting viral. So that's another concern with, with people, everyone concerned about COVID. There's a rise of false claims, dubious fake news, of course, and and even fake testing kits as well. Next slide. So here we are uh, now at this. Is, I already showed you this. We're past two thousand cases now in the Philippines. Next. So for just very quick reflections. Uh, again, like I said. Objects played a role in dramatizing and visualizing the crisis and mask wearing, which is really a, a, a very animated debate because even if I'm a medical doctor, I can't really say definitively whether we need it or not. I go by what people, WHO recommendation saying that we, we don't need it normally. But now people are evolving to say that we need it, like Austria is requiring it. So what does it mean? Is it a political way of saying that we're doing something given the symbol, symbolic value of masks? I think objects are very important to look at. Next slide. And I also want to highlight how social media is really mediating so much of what's happening, including some of the events that I talked about. I never saw them myself, but through social media, there's a new socialities that are being formed, including what we're doing now incidentally and this photo is that of people from the medical profession singing a song to inspire their colleagues so that's a, another theme that I, I think is very important to look at this is the first pandemic that is virtual unfolding virtually and nations are being compared to each other what's the implication of this comparative paradigm that we compare nations that are which is very different context to each other Next slide, I'm almost finished. So finally, I want to also explore how COVID-19 is a synthetic. The inequities are exacerbated. We see poor just yesterday, the poor in Metro Manila have started to riot and to protest against, uh, they're hungry, they're demanding for aid. So uh, how do we do this? How do we implement social distancing in the slums? And finally, next slide. I've come to the end of, of the presentation. So I hope we still have time for some discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gideon. Um, and thank you to each of our speakers uh, for giving us some great reflections on what's going on in different parts of the world and responses. So we want, we do have 10 minutes of our scheduled time for questions. And if people saw in the chat room the announcement, um, we can try to extend that time. Our three speakers, our three panelists, we're only scheduled for the next 10 minutes. So we want to definitely get to a few of kind of the reoccurring questions. And what we will do just to let um, everybody know, if you can move to the next slide. Uh, what we will do is on everyone who registered for this webinar you're also part of the communities page now and this is our ongoing area for a dialogue and for questions and any of the ones that we don't get answered by our panelists we have collected them all so we'll go ahead and post them all in there and as the speakers are able to they will try to give some answers and other people can have some conversations on the same questions one of the first ones that um, i wanted actually to kristen before you start Quick yes. announcement, um, I've been posting throughout the, the whole talk uh, a, little, a little blurb about our survey. 
with the link to the survey. So feel free if you haven't done it to go ahead and sign up for that. Yes. And also I posted the Facebook link a while back. I'll do that again. Perfect. And we'll make both those links available on the community's platform also. So one of the questions that I think globally um, is around the world is we're seeing fragmented messages um, from different governments, even within specific uh, countries in itself on the policies and recommendations on masks, to mask or not to mask. And I know each speaker you know, went through the mass, um, but I guess there, there seem, there's still a number of questions in there of, we know for the public health care workers, you know, the recommendations of masking, and then thinking of masks as a symbolic protection too. But for each of our panelists, what would their recommendation be? Um, in the U.S., we're actually having a scenario where people are making homemade masks to try to get them to healthcare workers. So I don't know if there's anything else any of the speakers wanted to remark about masks and the masking or not masking. Uh, can I share briefly that yes. in the Philippines, it's no longer a medical choice because you have to wear a mask. Like it will look weird. Mm -hmm. I went to the super, supermarket earlier and they're requiring people to wear masks inside the supermarket, even though there's some protests that you're taking away the masks from the healthcare workers. If we do that, then there will be none for those who actually need them. Yes. But, it, but that discourse is no longer happening. Instead, it's expe an expectation that everyone is seen in public wearing a mask. Okay, so if, I if I may, uh, a little bit about the masks. Yes. In Croatia, in Croatia, half of the population is wearing masks and half not. It's not usual, you know. It's it's very strange for the people to wear a mask. So, and uh, I, I was talking a little bit in my presentation about the masks, and I was explaining that um, all masks masks are not the same. So, uh, if we're talking about the protection, of course. Uh, so, it's a question: Would you like to protect somebody else or to protect yourself? So um, it's a good to wear the mask to protect if you are, you know, ill already, to protect all other people. It's anyway a little bit of protection, but it depends on which mask are you wearing. If you are wearing very simple masks, then it's not a protection. That's, that's you know, that, that the medical staffs are telling and it's not protection. There are some masks. I showed in my, my actually a presentation uh, uh, the, the source of masks. And some of these masks are protection, but those are probably more expensive masks and they are really protection. But to wear the gloves probably is more important than masks because you are, you are, you are, uh, if you are going to supermarket, masks, if you have a social distancing, uh, that's, that's probably go uh, good enough. But if you are uh, picking the, the, the things uh, from the supermarket, the gloves will be more important in this case. That's, that's what I think. Yeah? Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, Go ahead. Kristen, yes, yes, I would like to discuss some cultural issues here. And this is very interesting because it seems to me that um, Italy has its own um, peculiarities in this, I think. For example, compared to what other people were saying, also Gideon, I think. We, we didn't see, I, I personally didn't see any stigma on those who are positive. We, we mostly saw um, sympathy. And I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe because we have such a high case fatality rate, I, I don't know, but, but there's mostly sympathy towards people who are ill. We didn't see any stigma. Hmm. And another thing we didn't experience here is the stockpiling um, <laughs> um, phenomenon or, 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 or we don't have any for example we don't have any problem with, with toilet paper <laughs> and, and nobody I think nobody really thinks that uh, we will not find a, any food at the supermarket you don't see gatherings at, at supermarkets of people who are trying to stockpile food of course if you have a family and because here we are suggested to go to buy food only once a week Okay, or, or you can or you can have them, you can order it online and they will deliver it to you at home. Of course, if you, you know, if you have to take care of a, of a big family with maybe some children and, and for a week, 
so probably you will buy a lot of food, but but not that much. It's not there's no stockpiling. I haven't, and so uh, in in the same. So these are two differences probably. Um, I I realized because I will send many messages from abroad from friends from abroad that there is an issue with toilet paper, but we we don't see that here. And and a third thing I would like to say uh, about the uh, xenophobic argument. Um, don't use that as a uh, one and for all explanation. Um, I know people like uh, and me first, like simple explanation, but xenophobia can be a simplistic one. Uh, I'm not saying that there isn't. There certainly is, there's always been. But for example, one thing which I saw here, um, when, when, when the whole thing began, Many people from the south of Italy, but working and living in, in the area around Milan, went back to their home uh, towns in, in, in the south of Italy, okay? And they were rejected by their fellow citizens. Mm. So I wouldn't call it xenophobia. Mm. It's more of a pathophobia or something like that. Mm. So people are scared and, that, and that's human. It's not necessarily, uh, I would call it uh, usually I, I call this kind of uh, fallacy a reductio ad Hitlerum, you know, when, when, <laughs> when such an argument is used to explain everything. Um, rejection happened against people who, who were supposed to be, to be dangerous for, for the others, even if they were your fellow citizens coming back home. So it's not a matter of, of race or ethnicity. It's just that people are scared. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that argument as an overarching explanation for everything. It would be too simplistic. And, and I notice that often, also in, in discussions on WhatsApp, uh, that this, uh, that, that, you know, this reductio ad hitlerum is very often abused, let's say. So, and, and yes, and in, in this sense, I think um, um, there are, there are differences across countries, especially the fact that we stockpiling toilet paper uh, surprised me. And, and also the idea of putting stigma on, on, on ill people. Maybe, maybe uh, I don't know, here, you know, many of the ill are, are old people. So I think they, they rather get sympathy from, from the rest of us than stigma. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, one other question that each of our speakers also spoke about, and then a few questions um, that have come up among a number of participants is around the idea of social distancing and separating the vulnerable, either the elderly or the immunocompromised, and making sure we're separating them from others or from the youth. And one of the questions was how, uh, thinking of taking care of loved ones um, and those who are having to care for them in the house, how do you do that in a safe way? And then how do you social distance if you're living in a small apartment? That, that's part of the problem. I think many of the infections right now are happening within the apartments. There aren't many people going around after the lockdown. Uh, maybe the only possibility to meet other people is uh, in the shops, where you go, supermarket, where you go to buy food. So I think, I think that home delivery is a good alternative. Maybe we should enforce that as well. And, and, but, but the point is that many people are, are getting ill at home. Because let's say, for example, you know that, that to stop a, a pandemic to spread, uh, you must uh, uh, diminish the reproductive number uh, down to one or below, okay? But if you live with uh, other three or four people, and if pre let's say that prevalence is 20% and you're five, one of them is ill, for sure, and the other five will get ill soon. So um, staying at home is not enough. Uh, we, we must, uh, we must keep distant. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. David, uh, you know, probably the, the, the easiest way, as I told in my presentation, is to separate and uh, the risk, risk, you know, uh, people who are in risk, but very early. In mm -hmm. Italy, now it's too late. It's even too late. Um, uh, if you are on time, to be on time, that's the most important thing. Uh, I just um, come on an idea, you know, in Croatia, like we have now the empty hotels. So probably, you know, in one, one uh, to put all these people in risk in hotels, you know, it's, it's much cheaper for the state. And the state yeah. can pay them, you know, something 
to be in the hotels because they really have to be isolated. Uh, and there is no, if they only stay at home, it's not enough. It's not enough. Uh, because uh, you can uh, uh, bring the virus on your shoes, you know, or on, on the um, uh, sack from the su supermarket, you know, on, on, on every, you know, on every little thing you bring at home. Yeah. So if somebody has a problem and it's risk, it could be enough for them. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the problem. And social distancing or uh, distancing at all, it's, it's, it's okay. But, uh, you know, it has to be also uh, very careful in these things, you know, not, not you know, the people, uh, we can have uh, <laughs> psychological problems afterwards mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well. Kristen, so, um, if I could, can... Yeah. Can I ask just one other quick question? And we do have a little bit of time, so we can extend a little bit. Um, I just want to ask, um, there was also another uh, question that was running around, and I've seen it in the papers as well, um, regarding the temperature. I've heard at first that it didn't make a difference, and now I'm hearing that it does make a difference. Um, someone pointed out in their questions that when it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere, it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so what difference does that make? Number one and number two, is it, is this going to like the 1918 influenza? Is it going to come in waves where it comes in the spring and then disappears a little bit in the summer, comes back in the fall? Can anyone address that? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, as, if, if I can just let you know, uh, that's, that's what's so, something that we don't know, but if we have a COVID in Africa now at the moment, Australia, then the temperature is not a guarantee. Probably it will lower a little bit, uh, but uh, it will not disappear at all. Um, the, the other thing you have to know about the infectious diseases, if the virus comes to the population, uh, the, the virus will disappear only when 70% of population will, will be infected. And that's, that's the uh, rule of uh, in, in infectious, infectious science. So the 70% of uh, population, when the 70% of the population is infected, then, you know, it's a really low chance that this virus will fall down and will go a little bit by little. And at the moment, the chance for virus to, to, to stay and to come back, especially in autumn, is um, very serious and very realistic. Yeah. So for those, um, I, we, as Jeff just mentioned, we do have some time that we can add on and keep answering more questions. But for anyone who was scheduled to jump off at 2.30, I did want to advance to the next slide just to um, make sure that people know there are there is another webinar that is coming up and to save the date for April 9th. This one is going to focus on financial and economic focus, have a financial and economic focus of COVID-19. So the registration and details will be available soon, um, but please save the date and keep that in mind. And this is actually the second of a ser well, it's actually a series of webinars. And so all of these webinars are actually available on AAA. So if you go to the AAA site, the recordings are available for all of them. So please make sure um, you can get a hold of each of them. All of them are recorded and there's a YouTube video. Here's a link to the expertise database that Dion has also been posting in the chat room. And the, the next slide actually just says a, a big thank you, especially to our three speakers. It was really wonderful to be able to hear what's going on around the world and different responses and have a conversation together. And I wanted to also thank everybody at the American Anthropological Association, particularly Ed, Jeff, Scott, and Gabrielle, who were so helpful in helping us run all the logistics. I just wanted to get through those thank yous. And then if people are able to stay on, we can try to get through a few more questions. But I w wanted to be aware of the time that some people may need to jump off now. For those, I don't know if any of our speakers are able to stay on a little bit. Yes, it's, it's okay. no problem. <laughs> Not one of the other, um, and Gideon especially talked about thermal scanners and mentioned how thermal scanners are being used in the Philippines. And a few people had actually asked questions also about with thermal scanners, how much are they being used in other areas of the world? So I didn't know if we could actually just hear from different speakers about the use of thermal scanners as a way of prevention and, and uh, identification. 
in Croatia we don't have it now at the moment, you know, or or probably on on the on the uh, uh, on the border, but not not in the city. I don't know about Italy. Italy, Davide. Uh, say it again. <laughs> what was the question? Do, do you have a thermos uh, thermo scanners? Yes. Um, um, yes. Uh, people are being checked. Um, for example, when they enter companies, we were still allowed to to work. And uh, yes, basically in large supermarkets, they, they can check your, uh, your temperature. Um, there was a privacy issue being raised by our, um, uh, by our privacy um, authority. But, but of course, in, uh, all, all the data are being kept anonymous and they're not recorded. So, so yeah, that, that's because, you know, we, we are within the framework of the new GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, the EU privacy law, uh, which is quite strict. And, uh, but, but yes, um, actually I'm working with companies to take care of that. They, they actually check the temperature outside, uh, outside you know, the, the premises. So if, you, if your temperature is higher than um, 37.5, then you cannot go in. But they will not record the neither your name nor your temperature. So, you know, there's no privacy breach. Let's say. All right. Thank you. We did have one particular question um, for Sasha. Knowing you had mentioned in Croatia that there's not any required quarantine at this point. And a few people were asking if people are voluntarily socially distancing then, if there's not a mandate. Uh, no, in, in Croatia, the people ask to stay at home. They are asked to stay at home, but there is no, um, no, um, let me say so, uh, a must to stay at home. So uh, the people are not going out because no, nothing is working. So you cannot go out, you, you, you don't have a pubs, you don't have restaurants, not the, everything is closed. But the people are free to, you know, walk. But if you walk alone, uh, look at the street, if you walk in the mountain, if you go hiking, uh, there is no reason to be worried about it. I don't, I don't see any, any problems with that. Um, the problem is, you know, if you meet a lot of people, that's the problem. If you have a um, social meeting, that, that, that could be a problem. And, you know, you can infect some people, but if you are alone or just with your friend, you know, who is, it's just two people, it's okay. Now in Croatia, the, 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 the law is, and the rule is, you can meet up until three people in the same time. So yeah. that's, that's, that's the rule at the moment. But it's not, um, the quarantine, it's not, it's recommended. But it's not, you know, uh, the law. You have to stay in time. I, I agree with Sasha. The, the point is that here in Italy, for example, they close the parks. Because, you know, some people were probably underestimating the danger and they were gathering in groups. But that's not a solution. Because if you're jogging alone in a park, you're not putting your life or health at risk. Neither yours nor that of, of anyone else. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, so the point is not not to go to the park, rather not to gather with other people, be it in the park or at home. Actually, in the open air, there is less chance of contagion than indoor. That's a well-known fact. Yeah, and that's, um, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Since yeah. I remember, I remember the report of you know by Florence Nightingale during the war in Crimea, when she realized that if, if she opened the tents, where where you know ill soldiers were were recovering on their beds, the amount of so-called zymotic infections, as they called them back then, um, uh, diminished because the viral uh, charge. Uh, diminishes of course in the open air so yes yeah it's, it's stupid it, it example in zagreb is also all the uh, children's playgrounds and everything is uh, closed and the example i just want to go with my son you know to play you know we are living together so at the moment i just uh, 
I'm alone with my son at home, so I don't see any problem if I go to play with him basketball, something like this. It's even more healthier for us, you know, to, to, to make a, a physical activity. It's, it's not healthy not to do anything, you know, it's, it's unhealthy. And your immune, immune system is also building, let me say so, by, by doing physical activity. It's uh, lowering, it's falling down with, without doing those things. So uh, it must be something, you know, a little bit, uh, we have to think about these things. Yes, for sure. The lack of sunlight, lack of physical exercise will create even more problems. So mm -hmm. I always suggest people to exercise at home, at least as I do. Plus, I have a very small courtyard, you know, a backyard. So, I sometimes, you know, I go out sometimes to exercise a bit. Um, people who have a garden, for example, who, or who have a, a courtyard are much better off than those who live in small apartments without maybe a balcony, without um, a garden. And, and for them, it will be uh, more difficult to fight the disease and um, b because they lack the, you know, the sunlight, because they lack... Um, the fitness so so yes that could become an issue in a few so that's why um to i think that uh to avoid you know physical activity outdoor could be a problem with fighting the disease yeah, yeah exactly what they, david said and also the vitamin d which is very important lack of vitamin d and lack of sunlight that's that could be a problem in the long run and in the long run um this could uh, lead to a, a more more problem so like my son is sportist and he's doing nothing for a month you know now and uh, probably he'll be more obese and obese and obese you know and that's not good for his health um th that's something what we were talking about we have to make a real model rule uh, you can go to playground, you can run, but you know, on distancing or you can play basketball one on one, not probably uh, three on three or something like this, but, but you have to uh, let people to do an exercise outside, outdoor. Yes, the, um, for example, I think that one of the things which uh, kept us healthy in, in Italy and, and part of the reason why we, we live so long is that we still have the habit of the passeggiata, you know, of the, of the promenade, of walking around, and which is the main kind of physical exercise, especially old people are doing, you know, they just, maybe some ride a bicycle, there's a lot of bicycle riding here, and, and walking. Walking is the, probably the only kind of physical activity that especially old people are doing. If you forbid that, um, in the long run, it can be a problem. So, well, and that actually gets so as as has been the a few points brought up of the density of a population makes a big difference on transmission rates and and For how sure. this pandemic is spreading. Does anybody have um, any reflections on other countries that are more densely populated? I see in the chat room we've got people asking about in India or throughout Sub-Saharan Africa where the idea of socially distancing becomes a lot more difficult. Um, and then especially also wrapping in some of these components of how do you still get outside and get some vitamin D from the sunshine? Well, Christine, let me say something which I, I understand nowadays is not particularly, uh, is not politically correct for some reason, but most of the problems we are facing are related to demography. Okay, so if you have no demos, you will have no pandemos, uh, as simple as it may seem. So where you have a lot of people close together, uh, like in modern large cities around the globe, um, to fight a pandemic would be more difficult, as simple as it may seem. That's obvious. So, and, and of course, you know, we, we, we already know uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, pollution and, and now pandemics and all these problems are some way related to demography. Yes. Gideon, I don't know, are you still on? Yes, okay. I am, I'm, still, I'm still here, yes. I was wondering if you would have anything to add on kind of uh, density of population and, and being able to still go outside or not. That's an absolute concern here because 
it's not just the uh, actual residence that's difficult, but even public transport. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the Philippines, the commuting travel is by jeepneys and people really sit beside each other. So it, it's impossible to carry out right, everyday life without uh, but violating this one, one meter. So people are now debating here whether to lift the quarantine after two weeks. But some of the experts are cautioning that it's too soon. We, we don't even know yet the full picture of what's happening. But one thing is for sure that these social distancing uh, measures are really an untenable. And I don't see it being followed by people who, who live in very dense areas. So it's the, it doesn't make sense for them and they, they don't do it. Yes. It does bring up the idea of um, compliance versus non-compliance and then people being blamed. You know, if they, if they can't keep to that one meter or if they don't have water to wash their hands um, or, you know, if there's not a way to actually quit working and not go out. Um, not everybody does have the ability to, to comply to some of the policies. As somebody put in the chat window, the ability to social distance is almost a privilege in itself. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Usually the, the poorest family maybe are large families living in small apartments. Mm -hmm. The wealthy maybe live in large villas with, yeah. with a, a, a big garden outside and they can, they can go out and, 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 and have, have exercise in their, in their backyard, etc. So yes, uh, you're right. And, and that's why I'm not sure that closing you know, everybody at home is going to work. I mean, so social distancing works for sure. And, and, and since we do not have any vaccine, we do not have in any any effective antiviral um, medication. I think that um, social distancing is the only measure which is going to work mm -hmm. until we find a, a, a you know a proper medication or vaccine. And 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 I'm, I don't think it's going to happen quickly. But again, one thing is social distancing, which works, and a totally different thing is staying at home. I'm a single. Okay, my reproductive index will be zero. But what if, you know, some people like five or six live in the same? And here we have cases where, for example, it's very common that grandparents still live with the children, take care of the grandchildren, which is very good. Our, our for example, our elderly are very social. Uh, there are clubs here where they play cards, they, they play bocce bowling, and, and some of such places were, were um, places of, of contagion. So, again, um, people should be kept far from one another, uh, but that's not something which is necessarily going to happen at home, not for everyone at least. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the other points that was brought up a few in a few different areas in the chat, and maybe uh, Davida in Italy, you could answer some of, have something to say and kind of reflect on on this point of, if we get to the point where healthcare workers are then having to decide or decline treatment to vulnerable or older populations um, and kind of triage treatment, how difficult that becomes like an ethical and human rights um, issue and, and how to handle that. We have, here in the Philippines, we're not there yet to a point in which these very difficult ethically charged issues are, are being debated. But what's happening now as a matter of equity also is that we're, we're seeing politicians being prioritized in the testing. Mm -hmm. So it's really, I saw the news in, in the UK that they're questioning whether Prince Charles really deserved a test, but here, it's very clear that we have senators and their staff, even their household staff, being tested ahead of people who need it. And people have died without knowing their status mm. uh, with, because of these kinds of configurations. So there's a fear that if the situation becomes 
worse here in terms of people dying, then it will once again favor those with access to power and, and finances. Well, Gideon, while you're speaking, there was a question. Um, um, I'm trying to glance back. We have a whole slew of questions. So just to remind people, if we don't get to them all, we will try. We will work on collating these all and putting them into the community's platform. But one of the questions uh, specifically for you was thinking of xenophobia and comparable to other countries and what you see as, as that surge may be happening in the Philippines, if it's different than others in the area or not. Well, as we saw, as I saw that now it shifted that people are more afraid of those perceived as positive, then it was really more of they, there was no way to see which who are the people who have coronavirus. So race became a proxy at that time when it was heavily associated with 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 China. However, I also think that is a very local process and it unfolds differently depending on the context. So in the Philippines, attitudes towards China can only be viewed in relation to the context in which this resentment already because of the militarization of, of the West Philippine Sea and at the same time, the Ch Chinese influence here. One other uh question that I think is in everybody's mind, so I don't know if our speakers can just kind of reflect on what they're seeing in their countries, but one of the big questions people are having is uh, the possibility of reinfection. If, if people are infected once, are they then immune? And are, are each of you in your areas, are you seeing cases, um, or are the countries kind of seeing cases of reinfection? In Croatia, we don't see it. It's too early to see the, the, those things. But as we know, uh, till, till recent, till now, it's not possible, especially for this soy of uh, virus uh, COVID-19. Probably for a next mutation, it will be possible. Okay. But now, you know, for this one, but nobody knows for sure because it's very new. No, yes, yeah, too early. It's too early. I, I have seen and I've heard too many people um, saying things which have not been um, substantiated by enough evidence so far. So I would refrain from, we, we all hope that some kind of immunization will, will appear. But hey, let, you know, think about cold and flus. <laughs> yeah. You can get it anytime, again. And, and, and so we, we really do not know. Maybe it will last, well, I, I was speaking, as I told you, I actually have three um, friends who are anesthesiologists and one of them actually got the, um, the virus. So she was positive. And again, she went back home from hospital. So she was, because she tested positive, she stayed at home. She's experienced some, some temperature, typical symptoms. Um, she also lost her, I think, uh, the, the smell and taste, something. But anyway, she recovered that. And after a few days, her husband got ill. After just a few days, and he had to be admitted to hospital mm. with pneumonia. So again, staying at home <laughs> if someone is ill is not good. Yeah. It's not good. For example, nurses now, they, they don't go, many of the nurses and some of the doctors don't go back home. They, they've rented some apartments or, or hotel rooms to avoid, in fact, the, uh, you know, their relatives, children and, or maybe parents. And uh, so, yes. And, and she thinks that, well, we, I saw, for example, I was reading uh, an interesting uh, case study and, um, uh, from Iran. And of course, uh, the patients who recovered had some, uh, showed some, some kind of some sort of immunization, but it might be a short-term immunization. So we really do not know if once you recover, you'll be fine for the rest of your days. That's something we still do not know. 
Yeah, what, what happened in Croatia, actually, at the beginning, it was uh, totally wrong. Uh, the people who came uh, from Italy, so they must go in quarantine for 14 days. And so they went home, in quarantine home, but they were living with, with you know, for example, they were living with four other people, and those people were going to, to work, you know, it was uh, useless, actually, you know. <laughs> Especially uh, the virus is very spe spe specific because it's infect uh, you are very infected even you don't have any symptoms and that's the most the biggest problem yeah at the moment yes you're right you're right and and you you can you can be infected even if you do not have any symptom and and actually many of the people who are positives and that's something we we know almost for sure let's say we we do know that there are many people who are positive who are ill but do not show symptoms or maybe just very mild symptoms so, you know, anyone can actually be infected. That's why everyone should wear masks here. We are suggested to wear masks whenever we meet some, for example, when you go to the supermarket. Or, or if for some reason you're still working, there are of course um, some people who have to work, for example, those providing food or, or even more all the, um, the medical staff, they all should wear masks. Yeah, because nobody knows if he is positive or not, even if you don't have any symptom. So I think we're going to have to go ahead and wrap up. Um, I know it's very, very late uh, for Gideon, and I want to take the time to thank each of our panelists so much for spending uh, this time with us and sharing what is happening in your reflections on each of your locations. And encourage everyone, we will be collating all these questions. We'll put them on the communities platform. And that is an area we can continue these conversations on these collaborations and ongoing discussion. And we will, this webinar, the whole webinar with the slides is being recorded. We will get that link put out to everybody so you can share it widely. It will be open to the public. And feel free to join the Facebook page. Uh, we, uh, a lot of people share information about uh, their own ex experiences of different epidemics in different places, and also a lot of good articles. Yeah, and please feel, feel free. Uh, everybody can send me an email with a question. Uh, I'll be happy to answer now at the moment because, yeah. Yeah, and same, same for me. I want to give a great email somewhere, you know, on the, this uh, desk, so I will be. Um, Happy to, because I didn't have time. I saw that there were some questions for me as well, but you know, additional question. I was just speaking to you and I didn't have time to, 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 to write at the same time. So uh, probably more peaceful uh, tomorrow or uh, next week, I'll have more time. And I wanted to end with a big thank you to Kristen and Dion for running the show. Great job. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting us. Yeah, and uh, thank you to, to Ed, uh, to Jeff, uh, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, hope to see you uh, in, uh, in the near future. Great job, everyone. Great. Thanks to everyone for your interest, of course. Thanks thank again you. for having me here. Stay safe. Stay wait, safe, wait. stay Bye. healthy. Stay Goodbye. healthy. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.